Good morning, Russ. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Morning, Ben. Happy to be here and happy to be here. All right. So uh, I'm excited to talk with you because I know that you and your team, you've done a lot of work evaluating the use of field portable testing technologies on cannabis plants, which is is pretty exciting. And I know from, from our end on the medicinal genomic side with some of our testing technologies, that's something the growers are always interested in, something that's portable, something that's easy. So I'm excited to talk with you about what you've found. Um, but before we get into the specific types of instruments you've evaluated, uh, can you set the table, explain the value of portable testing to cannabis growers, and why were you and your team interested in evaluating them? Our first need was a selfish need as a breeding program. We wanted to be able to select across large populations, and the, the typical GC or HPLC platforms were too expensive. Uh, so we started trying to find methods that were uh, more economical to look at a thousand plants instead of just 10 or 20 plants. So our first interest was selfish to let us get the genetic gain, the breeding selection efficiency up. Uh, but then our sponsor noted very quickly, hey, dispensaries might want that. Other seed companies might want that. Uh, and if we can get it good enough on some of these tools, then law enforcement may want it. So it's, it's kind of a, an expansion of that that interest. Interesting. So, so you guys are, are breeding plants. So what sort of traits were you looking for? And, you know, how were some of these technologies helpful for you? Sure. Well, in Texas, uh, we're like most people, you have the 0.3% compliance for industrial hemp. Uh, so that was our first, first target tool. And we got lower cost suitcase HPLC systems in place, which were okay, uh, but still slow. Uh, and more than we'd like to pay. So the interest was trying to improve upon a couple of other near infrared instruments that are on the market uh, for that kind of a scan. And we've done that, we think. And then try to improve selection for things of interest more for the medical side, the trichomes in particular. And then for us as breeders, we wanted to look at varying the number of chromosomes in a plant. So the ploidy. Uh, I've done that with perennial grasses before working on hemp, and I think with hemp, it has a lot of value-added benefits uh, for fiber and grain in particular. Uh, so all three of our, our instruments we've developed have interest uh, to our breeding program in particular. All right, excellent. So, yeah, I, I think I, if you're growing hemp specifically, there is that requirement that it be under 0.3%. Talk a little bit about sort of what's at stake there, or how is that enforced? Um, are you know, could people knock at your door and start testing your plants and you need to make sure that everything is uh, compliant? Uh, they can and they have. And those tests have ranged anywhere from the presumptive, the little colorimetric test that law enforcement uses, which is always fun. Those tests will tell you, yes, this is cannabis. And we're like, well, great. We know it's cannabis. It's him. Right. <laughs> so then you go with a more <laughs> diagnostic test and we get more precise. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we uh, abide by those those rules set forth by the state and the, the federal government and the Texas Department of Ag. And the fun thing for us as a breeding program is uh, if we know it's hemp coming in, we can breed with it, proceed with generations of selection for other traits, heat tolerance, yield, whatever other trait we're interested in. And as long as we don't test for that compliance, we can keep going with generations. Before we ever release anything as a cultivar, of course, we have to do that. But it lets us uh, streamline our, our uh, generation time. So that's interesting. So once you're, when you're breeding with it, you don't have to continue to keep verifying that it's hemp. We know the parents for hemp, the right. progeny, the progeny may segregate. We can select the progeny for heat tolerance, drought tolerance, height, grain size, whatever. And we can proceed several generations, uh, for a breeding program. And then once we decide to release it as a cultivar, then we test those descendants and make sure they're still compliant, but we don't have to test every single plant and every single generation. That's interesting. But it, I mean, theoretically though, if you're, if you're starting with hemp and you're breeding both of them together, they're not going to suddenly turn into cannabis or are they? <laughs> well, that 0.3 is a, it's a pretty uh, stringent threshold mm -hmm. and you can get plants that are low in, in, in THC, but they're still above that 0.3. They can be 0 0.5, 0 0.8 or something. And that's happened with material we've looked at uh, from other regions we brought in, particularly from Asia. Some of those, they're below 1%, but they're not below 0.3. So we have to find the ones that are, and still that'll, that'll change with populations as you uh, work with them. So there's always a need to test them before we try to release anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So talk a bit about the, the technologies that you're using to sort of, I guess, verify that you're working with hemp, given that, you know, so much is, so much is at stake here. 
Sure. So we've had populations we know that are high and low in CBD, and our goal is to get a bell curve from 0% to 25% of CBD. And we've done the same thing more recently with the THC, looking for bell curves. And once we do that, we do two tests. We do an HPLC. So we know we know within that level of precision what it is. And then we will do our method of sampling and sample preparation and our modified optics we use with the near infrared spectrometer and use that. And after that, it's just a matter of having two data sets uh, and then running the, the statistics and the calibration and the modeling and the validation of those models. Okay, so so near infrared, what is that, and how is it different from you know HPLC? Sure, it's reflectance, but it's reflecting light that we cannot see. It's a it's a faster wavelength than what we see. We see this ultraviolet is down here, infrared is up here above it. We don't see it, uh, and some of the infrared gives us heat signatures. Some of it gives us other information, but it's all based on the fact that if you hit something with that, it's going to reflect back other other wavelengths and that's based on the vibration of the electrons in these molecules and the fun thing is if you're looking at uh, cannabis you can look at particular molecules and they're going to reflect different amounts of that infrared uh, the trick is really trying to be as precise as possible it's it's been shown before you can get to two or three percent accuracy but that's not all that great mm -hmm. our goal has been to get below one percent accuracy and have you met that goal uh, we have, <laughs> we haven't, we haven't quite breached that 0 0.3. We're, we're approaching that. And really that's, it's really, uh, the, the limitation is we are a, a breeding and genetics program. We are not a, a micro fabricator. So there's certain things with engineering we can't do in my lab. So we need to reach out to other engineers to do some fabrication. And once we can fabricate certain components to certain levels of precision at that stage, uh, then we can get there, I think. Okay, so that's a that's a good point of clarification here. So are you using sort of commercially available technologies and just sort of evaluating how they work? Or are you developing your own? So the spectrometer we use is a handheld spectrometer. You can buy it off the shelf. Uh, that's where it ends for off the shelf methods. The sampling method that we use is different than what's out there. So if, if you're familiar with the little purple or if you're familiar with the gem assert, those are both near infrared devices. They get you a little bit of information, but not that accurate. Uh, so the spectrometer is off the shelf. It's small. And the cool thing is, in the future, your, I, your iPhone 25 is going to have a near-infrared spectrometer on it. Mm. They demonstrated they could put it on cell phones back in 2016. So the technology is there. Uh, it's just a matter of putting it in there. Uh, but the optics, so the sampling we do is a bit different. Uh, and the optics is different in two ways. That, that's where we have our proprietary little little widget with it. Uh, the optics are different than both of those systems, and it lets us be more accurate. And then the modeling we do is is similar to what's been done for near infrared for other industries. You use near infrared for forage evaluation for all sorts of molecules. So the the uh, equations, the modeling, and validation is similar, but it still ends up being a bit unique uh, for the cannabinoids. Excellent. Um, now I forgot what I was going to ask next. Um, so how difficult is, are these instruments to use? Like, could the, could the average grower conceivably use this reliably and get repeatable results? Absolutely. Everything I do, I repeat it three times on every sample and you can do, uh, one sample in about 30 seconds. And by wow. the time you, by the time you run the analysis, it's still less than a minute. So from sampling, uh, to running the optics, to doing the, the analytics on it. Once it's once it's all put together, it can be done in one minute or less. We've got it. It's almost a two component system right now. It's just a matter of turning a tool from proof of concept to something that's more ergonomic uh, and, and user friendly. But the goal is to make it to where anyone can use it. Excellent. And now how important is at what stage of um, development in the plant you're testing? Like, are you testing, you know, finished, dried, cured uh, flower, or are you kind of testing it throughout its life? Sure. <laughs> so it gets back to, uh, we started testing at week zero of flowering when, you know, before it's everything really trichomes there and we started looking at every three or four days. So we went week zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And really there's not, even with HPOC, there's not a lot of appreciable, uh, cannabinoids until about week two of flowering. Sure. Uh, somewhere between week two and week three, you start to see it going up. Uh, so our goal has been to to calibrate it starting in that period. So any anything from about week two and a half 
uh, until a finished flower, we can we can sample and quantify. And the beautiful point you made was, unlike the little purple and gemisert, which require you to have dried cured, t cured tissue, which you grind up, uh, we can do dried or fresh tissue. Excellent. So that, that, that's been a beautiful a gain for us to do things out in the field on living plants. Um, all right. I, and now you mentioned, you know, this is just one of, I think, three different technologies that you are evaluating. Correct. Sure. Is that correct? Sure. We've moved a lot into microelectronics. I guess since we uh, applied to be uh, a participant in this conference, we've got a fourth device as well, more on the fiber oh, wow. side, but we'll throw that fiber device out. But the first one we started using was everyone wanted to look at the trichomes. Uh, and it's pretty simple to add a small little microscope attachment onto your cell phone now. And there are some of those that can get up to four or 600 magnification. They're very clear. So that one has been kind of a, a fun little freebie gimme. It'll probably be open source where you're just combining a cell phone based microscope, small attachment with image processing. So image J or some other version of that, that will do a few things. It will, it will identify the round pieces, the diameter. It'll classify the trichome heads. Once it classifies them, it will get the diameter and the volume and that will give you the basic size of it. And then we're also, still in the process, but working at getting the color of it. Mm -hmm. So looking at the pixel color so we can gauge maturity. So the goal of that one is just gonna be an open source cell phone attachment and an app where you can use that and look at your trichome and say, this is how big it is, uh, and this is how mature it is. So that, that's kind of a fun open source thing. It's been undergraduates and graduates. Uh, the third device has been getting back to the, the increase in chromosome numbers. So the ploidy, uh, if you think about uh, cells, if you increase the DNA in those, you increase the amount of protein, you increase the amount of everything that's involved with it in plants, you increase the cell wall size. So for fiber hemp, we're very interested in trying to see if we can make the bast and the herd fiber in particular longer by extending that cell wall. And by doing the, the chromosome doubling, we now have a lot of plants that are tetraploid. They don't have two sets of chromosomes, they have four. Uh, and those we have now confirmed can have improved fiber and, fi and improved grain. Uh, but to do the classification is very difficult. After you hit them with the treatment to induce a chromosome doubling, you have to figure out which ones have been doubled. Uh, the plants to the visual eye don't look that different. And the typical tool that's been used is called a flow cytometer. It is a capillary system. It's based on cell sorting. And for cannabis, which is a resin, resinous crop, you've got lots of sticky things in that extract. And you put that through these capillaries and it just blocks it up. It plugs mm -hmm. it up and you just ruin the capillary systems in your flow cytometer. So if you can't do that, you're left with, you're left with looking at chromosomes under a microscope, which is long and tedious, or trying to use some kind of indirect measure. And what we're coming up with is not a capillary system, uh, but a microfluidic system. Everything is going micron. Everything is eventually going to go nano. But taking the capillary system and making it smaller, you go to microfluidic channels. And once we do that, we're using these, these small flow cells to separate uh, the cells. And the fun thing is, if it's got four sets of chromosomes, it moves slower. If it's got two sets, it moves faster. So it's just like HPLC or GC. You're just flow sorting in that microfluidic channel. Uh, so when we have that, it's just a matter of running them on a, that fluidic channel and then looking at the speed of movement of them across that. And we can estimate whether they have had the chromosomes doubled or not. All right. No. All right. So a lot there. First thing, as a as someone who has dabbled with home growing um, <laughs> unsuccessfully, um, I think I've given up. But one of the things I always struggled with was the thing you mentioned about trichomes is, you know, looking with that magnifying glass. Is it milky? Is it not? So a tool like that, um, I think, would be very valuable, um, at least for <laughs> for people who are on my level. Well, my goal is to have either a video of us doing it or actually have something there in hand that we can demonstrate during the, during oh, yeah, the cool. conference uh, and just do live demos if we can't do videos of it. But yeah, that would be the one that we would bring there with us and have for people to play with and work with. I think that would be uh, perfect for anyone, homeowners, dispensary, breeders, seed companies, uh, those trichomes. Excellent. And now the tetraploid, uh, which is really interesting. Um, we had a presenter at our last can can at our last CAMED, Seth Crawford talking about triploid genomics and sure. some, of, some of the value that comes with that. So, so that's three sets, obviously, and this is four. So you mentioned some of the the advantages there being, you know, better fiber and grain. Um, now I know with with 
triploid that makes the plant actually sterile or you know that it can't reproduce right. same thing for tetraploid or can you actually breed with those no 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 trip we have triploids as well i guess oregon cbd demonstrated triploids and others have done it but basically you you take the diploid and double it and so you have one parent with two sets and one with four and you cross them you end up right. with one with three and that's your triploids and that's a beautiful plant for marijuana or drug types where you're going to be cloning vegetatively or even some of your higher value CBD, which is kind of questionable now if you're really going to be only propagating CD, CBD hemp. Uh, but triploids are beautiful for those systems because they're sterile. It's just like seedless bananas, seedless watermelons, seedless grapes. Those are all triploids for the same reason you have uh, sterility. Uh, so for certain uses, the triploids are interesting. Uh, for us, uh, it's more interesting to look at the tetraploids that have four sets because they are fertile. You can get seed off of those. You can get grain. And what we've seen so far, you can get larger grain. Excellent. So would you say that that technology would be less useful for your average grower unless they were going to try to breed for tetraploid specifically? <laughs> Maybe, most likely. But I guess we at our lab, we do some things for service and we don't really charge much for them. So we've improved the method of chromosome doubling. So I could see a, a time where... If people want to do that, they could send us hemp seed. Uh, and if things change, send us some other seed. We can do the actual treatment of double chromosomes and confirm it and send you back your tetravoid version of your favorite strain or your favorite home, oh, wow. home variety. Uh, eventually, I don't know, it, it could be a point where people do it both steps themselves, but we would have to sell that microfluidic uh, device, which it's kind of a goal is to be able to sell it. But making that simple enough for homeowners, you raise a very good question. I'm not... Not sure. Yeah, maybe not so much for home growers, but you know, yeah. maybe your commercial cultivators who who want to get into that. Um, yeah. yeah, and and maybe that's a good segue. Talk a bit more about um, some of the different services and things that you do over there at Texas A and M. Sure, we do uh, controlled crosses. So we have companies sending us seed, and they want us to make specific cross by cross. And the fun thing we've developed that isn't really part of this abstract. Uh, with cannabis, you really want to control the males and the pollen. Yep. And the industry typically tries to put them in different rooms. So you end up sacrificing the entire room for one pollinator, one male. And we've developed what is called a pollen control tent or a pollen, you know, pollen containment tent. And there's one company in the UK that makes these and they're very expensive. And we've made our own version. And basically the, the mesh around it lets enough light through the plant. It's happy. It grows just fine. You get, you get gas exchange, there's enough air in there, but it's small enough mesh, it's less than one micron, uh, it keeps the pollen from getting in or out. And cannabis pollen is about 25 microns, this screen is less than one micron. What's that let us do, it, we can put two parents we want to cross in there, a female and a male, no other pollen's going to get on that female except the pollen from the male you want, uh, and it can't leak pollen and contaminate other plants you have. So as a result, we have a greenhouse that's 3,000 square feet. We're not using all of it yet. And we are currently increasing seed on 120 crosses. So instead of having 120 rooms, one for each cross, we now have one modest size greenhouse where we're doing hundreds of individual crosses of different size. Sometimes we do a single plant and we inbreed it. Sometimes we do two or three plants for synthetic hybrids. And sometimes we do populations in these. But uh, it's been a beautiful tool. Wow, that's interesting. So, so you have the male and the female under one tent. We can do that, and the fun thing we've learned: we can make the female into a hermaphrodite, make it monoecious, where it has male and female flowers. We've learned how to work with that, so we can make a single female plant pollinate itself. So you sure. can breed it. And we've learned more recently: you can make a male plant produce female flowers. And we've started selfing those. So in your crazy wild mind, you might think of an all male cultivar instead of feminized seed, you might have masculinized seed for fiber. Male plants in general have better fiber quality. Uh, so our goal is to start doing some of the inbreeding services that people want us to do that as well. But we can make crosses for people, different types of crosses uh, for service. And we can do the chromosome doubling. That, that's also a service we, we have listed. And really anything that we get permission to do from the university and the Texas Department of Ag, we can use it, we can provide it uh, as a service. And when you do that, you send us seed, we get no IP, we're just doing a service. You give us uh, your seed, we give you seed back and you do whatever you like with it. Right, no, and you mentioned permission and in, in regulation. So you, again, you can only work with hemp, correct? 
So far, yes. We have to get approval from the university and from the Texas Department of Ag or TDA. Once we do that, any any project we propose and get approved, uh, we've got green lights. And now what is the limiting factor there? Is it federal regulation or state? Like, so for example, if Texas were to go um, full adult use, um, would that open things up for you or is kind of the federal regulation holding you back? That is a beautiful question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it would be above my pay grade. Sure. That would be up, that would be up to the, the department head or the dean or the vice chancellor, because actually the, the, the hemp research license that we have is not me. I'm just a lowly faculty member. Uh, it's actually signed by our dean. So it's up to the comfort level of the dean. If, if I think if the state approved, made it legal, uh, the TDA would give us a research permit or was legal, but it would still be a question of whether our director and dean would let us do it. So I think if we did that, uh, we could we could do so. And, and really, our administration has been very uh, helpful. They've not been setting up roadblocks. They've not been saying we can't do things. They've just said, be compliant and be careful. Excellent. Um, I want to talk a bit about your your background because I was reading your bio before I, I jumped on with you. Um, you know, you, you didn't start in cannabis. So talk a bit about what you did before and, and what made you switch. Sure. No, I actually started in biochemistry and then I went in the army. So I went non-traditional, came back <laughs> from the army and got into plant sciences. And really, uh, I've been a, a grass breeder, a perennial grass breeder for over 15 years now. And I teach classes. I always say I, I used to always say I was the grass breeder, but not the grass breeder. Uh, three years ago, when te- or two and a half years ago, uh, Texas green lighted hemp. And by that time, I had learned to use certain terpenes. Some are from cannabis, some are from other plants. Uh, that have helped myself, friends, and families for, for specific conditions. So I had a love for terpenes uh, from a nutraceutical standpoint. And we had started looking at terpenes as trying to make plasticizers of fibers to try to work at replacing some of these plastics. So we kind of jumped into different bioproducts as well with the grasses. I guess I had a job after my PhD turning grass fiber into ethanol. So trying to not use cornstarch, but trying to use cellulose. So I already had kind of an interest in the terpenes and an interest in the bioproducts. And the fun thing with hemp, when it, when it was legalized to me, you can not make one thing or two things. You can make six or seven things. And mm-hmm. if you have six or seven commodities off of one crop, no one major company or industry can shut you down. When I was working on ethanol, corn ethanol, they always kept their margin of nickel shorter than us. Every time we got ours a little cheaper, they made theirs even cheaper. So one energy company could shut us down. Uh, with industrial hemp and cannabis, no one, no one industry can do that. When you've got fiber, you've got grain, you've got terpenes, you've got cannabinoids, you've got all the bioproducts. Uh, so it's a beautiful crop to use as a biorefinery. I guess that's that's my love for it. Excellent. And yeah, with so many different uses, you need to be able to you know breed optimally, right? And I know you have some experience with marker-assisted breeding, so. What are some of the traits or markers that you're interested in or you think could be, you know, the future? So there's already markers for male versus female. There's already markers for CBD and THC. The markers we're really after for Texas and the southern U.S. are heat and drought. Uh, Most of the varieties from Europe and Colorado just do terrible down here, particularly central Texas and further south. And it'll be the same going to Florida all the way across the southern U.S. So we're really trying to focus on heat and drought. Uh, But other fun things are going to be modified trichomes. You know, there's an interest in making a fiber and grain type that has no cannabinoids. Uh, Mm. At that point, it would be considered a type five hemp. And that would be something that would make farmers not worry about it being compliant. That would make uh, parents not worry about milk having any residues in them. And it would give give the DEA headaches because they couldn't try to regulate it. There would be no schedule one molecule in it. Uh, So we could argue for a different type of classification of that. and the other thing we're after genetically really is uniformity. If you look at industrial hemp on a big acreage, the plants are all over the map for flowering, for branching, for uh, size and height. Uh, we're trying to get cannabis to be grown just like modern corn, modern major crops, where you have completely 100% inbred line parents. So they're uniform. You can propagate them by seed, just like rice or wheat. You plant the seed, it looks just like the parent. Uh, you can't do that with cannabis now. It varies. That's why it's all clonally propagated. But once we have inbred lines, we can cross those, and the F1s should be larger. They should have hybrid vigor. Uh, and we're, no one's really confirmed that. We're going to take the risk and see if we can. And we've got uh, uh, several 
pipeline is going to make inbred. So we should, by this time next year, be able to say, yes, you can inbreed to the fifth or sixth generation to make hybrids, or or no, you can't. Well, that's exciting. That could be uh, that could be yet next year's can med topic, perhaps. <laughs> so so winding down here. So I mean, if if growers are listening and they're kind of excited by these different technologies that you're putting together, um, you know. Are these going to be available to them? Like, how is that? Um, how is that process kind of work? We have a timeline. You know, I'm, I'm academia, so I'm way out of industry from over a decade, more than a decade now. But I'm very cognizant of trying to get things pre-commercial or have some kind of a commercial timeline, particularly for our sponsor. And I guess the three we have listed for this this program: uh, the open source microscope to look at trichomes and classify. That should be available this year, so by the end of 2023, and that, that'll be easy. Uh, the second one is the NIR platform, which we've now confirmed with utility for CBD and Delta 9. So we've got two of those. Uh, and that's really up to our sponsors, so they have the right to commercialize it as they desire. So it's, that'll be commercialized at their timeline. It, it's, sure. it's, been, it's, been, it's been disclosed. It's been released to them. It's a matter of how quickly they want to commercialize it. Uh, the third one for the DNA content, which may have a smaller audience, not as many people wanting to buy it. Uh, that one may be a little further out, uh, but it was still uh, either to be this year or next year, 2023 or 2024. All right. Excellent. And do we want to give us a plug to your sponsor real quick? Oh, uh, well, they, they introduced me to, to CanMed and to uh, Doug and you guys, and the company is Rare Earth Genomics, Excellent. based out of Texas and Houston. All right. All right, Russ. Well, before I let you go, I wanted to give you a chance to first share any other resources that the listeners might be interested in. If they're you know interested in learning more or reading up on some of the things that we talked about, I can always put links into the show description um, that they can learn more. And then also, please plug your, your program or you if you're on social media, anything like that, um, so that people can learn more about you and the work that your team's doing. <laughs> So I'm old enough, my only social media is LinkedIn. But LinkedIn, we do have things we haven't talked about. We've got a, a conversion program. You talked about home grows. We're taking donations and making any donation of pollen we get into compliant hemp, and we're going to release that. So we're going to have a public open source trimplasm collection uh, start to come out this year, and it's called the Hemp Conversion Program. So that's on our LinkedIn or my LinkedIn page. If you just search LinkedIn for Hemp Conversion Program, uh, it got a federal grant to help expand it, so it's going to be bigger by next year. That's a fun one. We have other projects going on. So if, if they have interest, you know, if anyone has interest in other ideas or other bioproducts, uh, we're more than happy to visit uh, and develop those ideas. All right. All right. Thanks again, Russ, for taking the time to be on the podcast. And uh, I look forward to seeing you down in Florida. <laughs> All right. I do as well, Ben. Thank you very much. <laughs>